All right, in this tutorial, we're going to talk about how to load vertex data onto the GPU. And this might include things like geometry, color information, normals, texture coordinates, and so on. Good. So a lot of this tutorial is based on what you see here. This is what we want to make, a triangle. And you can see that it has three vertices, and each of those vertices has a different color. Now, one of the underlying assumptions for this example is that we're going to be working in the normalized device coordinate system. What this means is that the range of our coordinate system is going to be between negative 1 and positive 1. So, for example, if we wanted a vertex to appear on the left-hand side of the screen, its x-coordinate would be negative, and if we wanted it to appear on the right-hand side of the screen, it would be positive. Similarly, if we wanted the vertex to appear in the top half of the screen, it would be positive, and if we wanted it in the bottom half, it would be negative. This also implies that the middle of the screen is 0, 0, and any values that are outside the range of negative 1 to positive 1 aren't going to be visible. Based on that, you can see that our triangle has the following coordinates. Now, you may be asking yourself why each vertex has three components. It's technically because we have an x, y, and a z. Realize that later we'll get into coordinate systems that actually use the z component, but even then they'll get mathematically converted into this range between negative 1 and positive 1. In this example, we're going to manually color the vertices. Realize that this is not normally how it's done. You typically would use light positions and light directions and then calculate how much light is actually hitting the vertex. But in this case, let's go over some basic color theory. First of all, you need to understand that we can represent almost any color just by adding components of red, green, and blue. You might have also heard of something called alpha, and this is simply the transparency of the color or how much you can see through it. Red, green, and blue are called the primary colors, and a lot of times they're denoted as R, G, and B. If you include the alpha, it's RGBA. Each one of these components has an independent value, where 0.0, .0 .0 means that it's all the way off, and 1.0 means that it's all the way on. So you can see a couple of examples below. If we wanted the color red, we would have values 1, 0, 0, 1, and that fourth component is the transparency, meaning that it's fully visible. Blue could look like 0, 0, 1, 1. To show that these channels are independent, you might have 1, 0, 1, 1, which would be the color purple, or 1, 1, 0, 1, which would be the color yellow. And then over on the right-hand side, you can see that to make the color white, all channels would be all the way on. And to make the color black, all channels would be off except for the transparency. To make something in between black and white, or gray, you can see that it's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 1. And then we can do any kind of theme and variations past that point. We could make the color brown as 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, and 1. All right, based on that knowledge, you could see that the values of the colors of our vertices might look like what you see here. And this also brings up a really good discussion about interpolation. Notice that if I give values to each of these vertices, OpenGL automatically interpolates between those values. So if I give this vertex here the value blue, and I give this vertex here the value red, OpenGL is automatically going to interpolate along this edge between red and blue. And you can see the same thing is true between all of these vertices. One really nice thing about this interpolation is that it does go on in the shader, but it also works across our normals and our texture coordinates as well. So here's the basic problem. How do we get all of this information onto our graphics card? Realize that in addition to its position, each vertex typically has a normal and a texture coordinate associated with it. So we need to find a way to put that information onto the GPU and organize it in a meaningful way. So to begin with, what we're going to do is to create something called a buffer object. Realize that this is just a chunk of memory, it's very similar to an array, and it's nothing to be afraid of. This buffer object can be located in a couple of different places, but for now we're just going to leave it on the GPU. Now code-wise, to create a buffer object is not very difficult. In this first line right here, you can see that we're going to create an ID here, which is just a glue int, and we're going to call it buffer. And then we're going to make a call to glgenBuffers, telling it how many buffers we want to create. In this case, we're only going to create one. Once we've done that, it's going to put the ID of that buffer into this variable that we've passed here called buffer. Now, usually immediately after that, you make a call to glBindBuffer, passing it the ID of the buffer that you want to bind. Now, what does that mean to bind it? It means really to make it active. Anything that you do that's buffer related is going to be referring to that buffer. So, for example, any drawing of triangles that you might do, that's going to come from the buffer, or any loading that you might do is going to go into that buffer. There are two different approaches that you might take when you're loading a buffer with data. For the first example, let's assume that everything is located in a glfloat array called data. If that's the case, we might do this one-shot call to glbufferData. Now here you can see if we call glbufferData, we would pass it this constant glArrayBuffer, followed by the size of the array, and this would be in bytes, 
and then we would pass it the actual data followed by this constant GL static draw. Once we've done that, it actually transfers everything that was in data over to GPU. Now there's a little bit of discussion about this last constant here, this GL static draw. It doesn't have to be GL static draw. We have a couple of different options, but it does follow this template here, GL underscore X underscore Y, where the X is either stream, static, or dynamic. Now for this class, realize that we're gonna be using static almost exclusively, but realize that you do have the stream and dynamic options for how frequently this information is gonna change. In other words, if you had some geometry that was changing frequently, you might look into the dynamic option. And for the Y part, it could be either draw, read, or copy, but here we're gonna be using draw almost exclusively as well. The second approach to loading data onto the GPU is actually how we'll do it in this class. The basic process is to create a buffer and pass no data at that time. And right after that, we're gonna load the information in chunks. So for example, we might load the positions of the vertices first, followed by any color information we might have, followed immediately by some normals and texture coordinates and so on. Now realize that it's possible to interlace the vertex data such that all information about one vertex is located together, but that's not what we're gonna do here. Now to get a better understanding of what's going on, it's always good to see an example. In this case, we're gonna visualize the buffer, but we're also gonna show the relationship between the client code, the OpenGL code, and the shader code. So let's keep the assumption that we're still trying to draw that one triangle that we saw at the beginning of this tutorial. To simplify the explanation, I'm going to declare a couple of variables here. The first one is num vertices, and this is clearly the number of vertices, which is gonna be three. There are also two different arrays of GL floats. The first one we'll call verts, which is the position information for each vertex, and the second is colors, which is the color information for each vertex. Notice that verts is organized as a series of X, Y, and Z positions, whereas colors is organized as a series of RGBA. All right, good. In these first two lines, you can see that we ask OpenGL to create a buffer for us, and we put the ID of that into this variable called buffer. Just after that, we make a call to GL bind buffer, and we pass it the ID of the buffer. And just after that, we make a call to GL buffer data, passing it a couple of different parameters. This first parameter is the constant GL array buffer, and that just describes the kind of buffer that we're working with. But the next parameter is a little bit more involved, and we need to talk about it. Notice that we're going to pass num vertices times 7 times the size of GL float. Realize that this parameter is how we tell OpenGL how big of a buffer we need, and this is in bytes. So clearly we need num vertices, but the question is, why is it multiplied by 7? Where did the 7 come from? Well, realize that for every vertex that we have, we have seven parts. We have X, Y, Z, and we also have RGBA. Now the next parameter past that, notice that we're passing null. This is how we tell OpenGL that we'll pass the information at a later point. So let's go ahead and do that. Notice that we've done this in two separate calls to GL buffer sub data. In the first call, we're gonna load the position information, and in the second call, we're gonna load the color information. Now, if we look at the parameters here, you can see that we still pass the constant GL array buffer, but the parameter past that is zero. Now, what does the zero mean? It means begin loading this information at the beginning of the buffer. The next parameter is the size of the information that we're gonna put on the buffer. In this case, it's num vertices times three times the size of GL float, and the three comes from the X, Y, and Z components. And then the last parameter here is verts, which is our array of vertex positions. Now dropping down to the next call to GL buffer subdata, you can see it's really similar, but the second parameter is much different. Whereas previously we began to load at the beginning of the buffer by passing it a zero, here we're gonna pass num vertices times three times size of GL float. In other words, we wanna begin loading the color information just after loading the position information. The third parameter here is num vertices times four, and again, because of the RGBA. And then finally, as a last parameter, you have the array of color information. Okay, so what do we have so far? Right now we have a buffer that has an ID and that buffer lives on the graphics card. The buffer currently is loaded with vertex position and color information. So the question is, how do we get that information to our shader? Or better yet, how does the shader access the information that's in the buffer? Well, to be able to pull this off, you have to query the shader program for its variables. Now, if you look at the code below, you can see that we're gonna make a call to GL get a trib location. This function takes two parameters, it takes the shader program ID, and it also takes the name of one of the variables inside of that shader program. Now when this function runs, it's gonna return us the ID of that variable inside that shader. And just to let you know, if it ever returns a negative one, that means that it either couldn't find it or that variable was never used. 
Now it's not enough just to get the ID of the variable, we also have to enable it. And to do that, we're going to call glEnableVertexAttribArray, passing it the ID of the variable that we want to turn on. In this case, vPause. And then as a last step, we can tell that variable where it can find the information it's looking for in the currently active buffer, as well as the format of that data. So let's see an example. In this example, you can see our OpenGL client code on the top part of the screen, and you can see our vertex shader on the bottom part of the screen. Now the first thing that we do in our OpenGL code is make a call to glGetAttribLocation, passing it the shader program ID as well as the variable that we're interested in. And again, this is going to return us the ID of vPosition in this case. Just after that, we make the variable active, and then we make a call to glVertexAttribPointer. Now again, what we're trying to do with that call is to bind that variable to a particular spot in the buffer. In this case, what we're saying is that vPosition can find the information that it's looking for at the beginning of the buffer. Continuing on in our client code, you can see that we make another call to glGetAttribLocation, except this time we're interested in the variable vColor. Now again, this is going to return us the ID of vColor, and we're going to store that into lock2. Just after that, we enable it, and then we make another call to glVertexAttribPointer. In this case, the second parameter is different because it's RGBA. And then the last parameter is how far into the buffer it needs to go to find the beginning of the colors information. So here's what the final code would look like. Now there is one last thing that we need to talk about, and they're called vertex array objects. Realize that you don't have to use these things, but they are pretty convenient because they can remember almost everything about buffers. The basic idea is that you set them up once and then you call them just before you draw your triangles to the screen. Now, do you remember the headache of working with GL Vertex a trib pointer? The nice thing is that vertex array objects can remember all that stuff. However, you need to keep in mind that it doesn't actually bind the vertex buffer object. So you have to do that manually. If you want to see an example of what that would look like code-wise, you can see these three lines of code here. In the first line, we declare a variable. In the second line, you call glgen vertex arrays. And in this case, we want to create exactly one unique ID. And then in the third line, we call gl bind vertex array. From that point on, anything that we do with gl vertex a trib pointer is remembered by the VAO. So if we try to piece all this together, you can see here's the entire code. In the first two lines, we create and bind a vertex array object. Just after that, we bring to life a vertex buffer object and bind it. The line that you see right here allocates space for the buffer, and then these two lines right here copy the information over to it. Just after that, we find the IDs of the variables inside the shader. Then we tell those variables where they can find their information in the buffer. We make a call to GL use program before we draw any triangles. And we also want to make sure that all the variables that we're using in the shader are enabled. So that's it. I know this was a lot of information, so this is something that I would recommend that you watch a couple of times until you become comfortable with it.